second point is uh, the uh, by convention it's for the uh, the reverse inlet version of subtraction and division. Um, but the way you can do it is you can just say is it equal to zero. So equals equals uh, is a tester that compares whether two things are equal to each other. In this case, the thing that we're comparing to is the number zero. So is one equal to zero? No. Is zero equal to zero? Yes. So that's how you do a logical not. Use equals zero. Uh, so equals, of course, you can use to compare uh, any two numbers. Uh, so you can say, is it equal to 10? And of course, the toggle will never give you a value that's equal to 10, because it only outputs 1 or 0. But you can use it not just with 1s and 0s, obviously, but with any number you want. Is 7 equal to 10, 8, 9, 10? Yay! So that's how you can search for an exact number. Now remember, we, we saw in the very first lesson that you can um, you can look for a range of numbers. So if I want to have the numbers between 10 and 20, then we can use this split object. And instead of outputting a yes or no, it's going to uh, either put it out one outlet or out the other outlet. So none of these numbers are between 10 and 20, so they're all going out the right outlet, and then all these numbers are between 10 and 20, so they're going out the left, and then all these further numbers are going out the right. So what if I just wanted uh, a yes or a no? Well, I could make it, I can use a message box, and I can say if it is between 10 and 20, I want a 1, and if it's not between 10 and 20, I want a 0. And then we can connect that to our toggle to view it. And so there you go, these numbers are not between 10 and 20, so the toggle is showing a 0, but these numbers are between 10 and 20, so the toggle is showing a 1. We can also use uh, some numeric comparisons to see if something is greater than or equal to or less than or equal to and so on. So there's an object uh, just greater than. So we can ask, is the input greater than 100? Let me just uh, duplicate this. And I will cut this, and I will paste replace it over there. So are there any of these numbers greater than 100? No, but these all are. OK, so again, it's giving you a yes or no. Uh, and if you want to use floating point numbers, um, then you need to use a floating point greater than object. So uh, 101, the floating point number, gets converted to the integer 101, uh, which is greater than 100. Yeah, no problem. But if you put in 100.7, that gets converted to the integer 100, which is not greater than 100. So this is a, a seeming wrong behavior. But if we make this a floating point greater than object, and we put in 100.7, 100.8, then it's doing a floating point comparison. There's no rounding, no truncation, uh, no conversion to int. You get what you want. So uh, there's equals greater than, less than. There's also greater than or equal to. So uh, is 100, is exactly 100 greater than 100? No. But so if you want it to uh, include 100, then you can use greater than or equal to. So 100 is greater than or equal to 100. Uh, and likewise, there's less than and less than or equal to. Okay, so this is the building blocks of doing different kinds of logical uh, Boolean computations in Max. Let's make a little example that will make some decisions and give different behavior based on the result of those decisions. So I'm going to save this patch so you can have it to study for later. So let's make a new patch. And let's use the mouse state object that we looked at in the first session. And the mouse state is going to give us the horizontal location and the vertical location in pixels of where is the mouse on screen right now. And you need to uh, you need to ask it every so often. You need to send a bang for it to report. So let's do it on a fairly fast rate. 50 milliseconds is about as fast as uh, as is meaningful for moving the mouse around. So here we are. And as you may recall, uh, let me unzoom here. So as you may recall, this is a 1920 by 1080 uh, screen. So we're going to think of it divided into four quadrants. So we're going to say, first of all, are we in the upper half or the lower half? So let's do that. And the way we do that is we look at the uh, vertical location. And if it's, it goes up to 1080, so half of 1080 is 540. So if it's a number between 0 and 539, we'll call that the upper half. And if we're 540 or below, we'll call it the lower half. Okay. So there's our 540. So we're just going to simply ask, are we greater than 540? OK, so bottom half of the screen, yes. Top half of the screen, no. And then let's do it again horizontally. So 1920 divided by 2 is uh, 960. So let's again ask whether we're on the left side or the right side of the screen by comparing to 960. So here's the left half, and here's the right half. So now we've divided the screen into four quadrants, uh, upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. And uh, let's make a. Uh, now let's, add, let's make some behavior for the four quadrants. So uh, let's think about it. I'm going to put a little comment so I can collect my thoughts here. So four quadrants, colon. One of the things about comments, you can, you can hit the enter key, and you can type some stuff, and type some other stuff, and type some other stuff. And it seems like you can format it and use, uh, uh, use like, spaces to indent and stuff. Um, but uh, it, tends to, uh, it tends to lose that formatting. If I save this, um, four quadrant behavior, and reopen it. Whoops. Uh, open recent patcher, four quadrant behavior. So Max, like many applications uh, these days, keeps track of the documents that have recently been opened. So that uh, seems to work. I, uh, for a while, Max didn't do well with this, and I got out of the habit of it. I would find myself making multiple comments and indenting them manually on screen like this. But uh, maybe it's time for me to outgrow my old superstitious ways and just trust that the comments can work. So let's try it. So uh, upper left, let's have it make a sign wave. Uh, for the upper right, we'll make it play the huh sample, because that was fun. And uh, lower left, we'll have it make noise. And lower right, we'll make it be silent. OK, so let's make our sine wave thing. So we'll start with just a 440 hertz sine wave, and we will multiply it by a 0 or a 1 based on whether we're in the upper left quadrant or not. So how do we know if we're in the upper left quadrant? Uh, by the way, notice we quit the patch and reopened it, and so this toggle was off. So let's, uh, let's make it default to being on using a load mess. Load mess 1, there we go. So I'm going to close it and open it again so that it will load, and boom, there it is on reporting. So what I say upper left is the sign. So upper left is when both of these are 0. So I'm going to, when both of them are 0, then that means that they, it means that one is 0, and that one is 0. 
So upper left, they're both zero. Upper right, they're not both zero. Lower right, lower left. Okay, so here they are both zero. So there we go. So this is what we want. This is our one or zero. And we're just going to use that as the amount that we multiply the cycle by. So the output of this multiply object we'll view it on the scope. We'll turn signal processing on, and it's pure silence, flat line, as long as we're in these three quadrants. So we move the mouse up here, and there's a sine wave. We go out, it's out, in, out. So that's good. And we'll put it through a gain so it doesn't have to be too, too loud. And we'll put it through our easy DAC so we can hear it. And uh, let's put it through the left channel since it's on the left side of the screen. That'll be a, sort of a fun pun. All right, I like it already. Uh, so I'm saying, uh, so we might as well get our huh sound. So let's grab that from our samples in here. I guess, uh, I guess it's supposed to have three views. Oh, I keep, uh, keep making this problem. Unlock, huh, drag, boom, there it is. I'm going turn this off for now so I don't, don't hear that as I'm going. Um, so how do I know that I'm in the upper right? It means that this one's on and that one's off. So it's kind of like this, except we want that one to be a 1, and that one to be a 0. Yeah, upper left, upper right, neither, neither. So there we go. So there it is, on and off. Now, um, this sine wave is continuous. This cycle object is always outputting. Well, as long as audio is on, it's outputting. And the times object, as I just showed, is either multiplying it by a 1 or by 0. OK, but the huh object, well, the easy thing to do, let's start with the easy thing. We'll just make it loop, and we'll just make it always be playing. So we'll put another load mess on here. Here's our version 1, where it's just going, huh, 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 over and over and over again when we uh, get into this zone. So that'll be just like this here. If I go take all this stuff, we're going to copy that. And we're going to multiply our huh by our yes or no value. And our huh is going to be constantly going. And we're going to put this on the right output channel because it's on the right part of the screen. But I don't find that super satisfying. I want it to trigger the sound as soon as I get into that, as soon as I get into that quadrant. I'm going to show you another object called change. So what change does, um, well, first of all, let me just tell you, every 50 milliseconds, mouse state outputs these two values. And, uh, and this logical comparison is made. So whether we're in that quadrant is a fact that we're determining every 50 milliseconds. Uh, that's continuous, but as you can see, there's like a long string of times that we're not in that quadrant, and then once we get in that quadrant, there's a long, long string of times that we are in that quadrant. So what the change object does is it filters out repetitions of a number. So we'll forget that print. We'll put the print on the change. The input is a, is a 1 or 0. The output's going to be 1 or 0. I'll clear the max window. And you see it's not giving me multiple copies. It's only when I go into the quadrant that gives me the 1, and it's only when I finally leave the quadrant that it gives me a single 0. In doesn't mean that I am in. It means that I went in. And this doesn't mean that I am out. It only outputs once right at the moment that I go out. So when the change outputs a 1, I'm going to send a 1 to this. In fact, conveniently, the 1 and the 0 is exactly what I need for the playlist object, because 1 means play and 0 means stop. So now, if I turn sound on, every time I go into the quadrant, it's going to trigger the sample right from the beginning. Kind of fun. OK, so there's our huh. And uh, you can kind of see where this is going. Let's just for completion's sake, let's put a noise in here. And I think uh, we talked about pink. It only outputs once right at the moment that I go out. So when the change outputs a 1, I'm going to send a 1 to this. In fact, conveniently, the 1 and the 0 is exactly what I need for the playlist object, because 1 means play and 0 means stop. So now, if I turn sound on, every time I go into the quadrant, it's going to trigger the sample right from the beginning. Kind of fun. Okay, so there's our huh, and uh, you can kind of see where this is going. Let's just for completion sake, let's put a noise in here. And I think uh, we talked about pink noise sounds a little bit nicer than white noise, and we'll give that its own gain, and we'll put it in the left channel. And how do we know that we're in the lower left? It means that I can just see from the mouse. It means that this is going to be zero, and this is going to be one. So we'll we'll use that. Are we zero? Are we one? So here we go. Lower left is going to be our noise, and we'll play past the pink noise to this amplitude envelope, and we'll hear it if we connect it properly. Noise, sign, noise, sign, huh. And we don't have to do anything to make it be silent because all these other things turn off when we're not in their quadrant. So there we go. There's a, a simple, perhaps somewhat uh, interesting or fun way of motivating uh, the use of Boolean logic to make these kinds of decisions. So I'll put a cleaned up version of this patch in the download. Actually, maybe this is a good chance to, uh, to see the process of it. Anyway, I made this patch is somewhat messy, so let me think about how I would make it less messy. So first thing that I often find is I need more space. I'm going to want to be able to rearrange this. I don't like how this patch cable is kind of crossing over everything, so I want to be able to put this stuff above this stuff. But I'm kind of running out of vertical space. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make all these objects be close to each other. And there is a way to say scale spacing. Uh, they can make them closer to each other. And I think there's a way to also say uh, distribute vertically. So now they're on equal spacing, and now we can scale them so that they're nice and tight talking to each other. And likewise, we'll make these not too close because I don't have room to be able to see the cable. And I want to put this right under that one, and I'll put that right under that one. And I want these to line up perfectly. Command Y. I want these to line up perfectly. Command Y. I want this right under that. So I'm just, you know, when I'm, when I'm first making the patch, I kind of have more space than I need. And then once I've tested the patch, I know it works, and I'm not going to insert anything, etc. So I can kind of uh, clean up like that. So this is our main decision stuff. And then here is how we know we're in the upper left quadrant. And I'll put that over there. Uh, maybe we don't need uh, that anymore. Put that down there again. I'm just kind of conserving space in the patch and putting things together that uh, are logically together. I don't want to put this too far up because I don't like the way these patch cables are, uh, are crossing each other. So I'll put that like that, make some room over here. So this is, um, you know, it's just kind of housekeeping, tidying. Uh, I got it working, and now I'm just kind of fussing with it, making it look more the way I wanted. So here's the here's thing that people often do. Here's a little stylistic thing. Here's this time tilde object, and it's got two inputs, and uh, the spacing of the inlets is pretty small. But the pink object has a certain width, and the trigger object has a certain width. One thing you can do is you can line up the times object with its left input so that you get a nice straight patch cord here, good for uh, compulsive people. And then you can just widen the times object. So that, that's just a stylistic thing. So this object is wider than it needs to be, but that lets both of the, it lets this pink be as close as I want to the toggle, uh, and now I have straight patch cords. So, uh, you know, just kind of thing you can do. So here's that, here's that. So that's feeling like a little bit neater and tidier. And then let's just tidy up this side. We can pull that same trick. So some people do this compulsively, and uh, you know, all their objects are uh, as wide as necessary so that most of their patch cords can be straight. Um, I personally like a, a mixture of straight and curved patch cords. It's just a matter of how easily can you read what's going on. And I'm going to put this as high as I can. Whoops, I wanted to grab this guy too. Put this as high as I can without, um, again, without making these patch cords cross or be confusing. So maybe that's good. And then uh, the change is going to, maybe I'll put it, I don't think that's too bad. The way that this, the outlet is below the inlet, but I got some room for this nice kind of S curve. And then we can put this in. I don't think we need this load mess anymore, actually, because we're sending it one whenever we go into that quadrant. So I'm just going to delete that. And then I'm just going to uncross this stuff. And we don't need this print anymore, so I'm going to take that out. That was just part of debugging your explanation. So uh, maybe you agree that this is a, uh, 
a nicer looking version of that patch that we had. So this will be what's in the downloadable resources for this lesson. So I hope that example gives you an idea of the kinds of decision making that you can do in your Max patch. And of course, it's going to be much more complex than just the four quadrants of the screen. Uh, by the way, speaking of the screen, some of you may be wondering, well, what if my screen's resolution isn't 1920 by 1080? Uh, Max has an object called screen size that uh, if you click it, it tells you uh, how big the main screen is, uh, left, top, right, bottom. So it goes from 00 to 19, 20, 1080. And if you have multiple monitors uh, or you're connected to a projector, maybe you're a VJ, uh, screen size will tell you the total uh, size of, of all your screens, your uh, combined desktop that's spanning all these various displays. So you could put in a screen size object and a load bang, and you could uh, extract the third and fourth elements of this list. Actually, you don't know how to do that yet, but um, uh, you'll see. I'll do it. I'll put in the course uh, downloadable resources. I'll put another version of this patch that uh, operates with any size screen using this technique. In this lesson, we're going to use some of our newly learned mathematical techniques to look a little bit more deeply into the question of musical scales and tuning and intervals and frequencies and these sorts of things. So first thing is I want to go back to uh, lesson two. Remember this, the uh, correct keyboard trigger to transposing sample? So we can play little goofy melodies. <laughs> And where did all these numbers come from? Uh, I just kind of told you not to think about it too much. But these are actually just intervals on the uh, 12-tone equal tempered scale. So the dominant tuning system of music today is based on dividing the octave into 12 equal parts. It's called 12-tone equal temperament because we are making equal divisions of the octave. Now, we know that, uh, we, that we hear frequencies on a logarithmic scale. So these are logarithmic divisions of the octave. So uh, let's talk through the math for that. Take my word for it, and you'll understand why in a moment. The 12th root of 2 is the...
the frequency ratio that corresponds to a half step. So what is this all through to? It's about 1.059 something. And uh, where does this come from? So if you, if you have something and you play it at speed 1.059, you're playing a little bit faster, and it's just enough faster that it's going to be a half step higher. So speed 1.059, speed 1 is the original speed 1.059 is a half step higher. What do we want to go two half steps higher? Well, we go up one half step by multiplying by 1.059 12 through 2, and then we go up another half step by multiplying again by 12 through 2. So uh, multiply it by 12 through 2 once to go up half step, multiply it by 12 through 2 a second time to go up a second half step. So if we continue this process, third, fourth, fifth, all the way up to the 12th half step, we're multiplying our original, original speed, 1, the default normal speed, by 12 through 2 times the 12 through 2 times 12 through 2, in other words, to the 12th power. And we know the 12 through 2 to the 12th power equals 1. It's like that uh, to the 12th power and the 12th root cancel each other, and you just get uh, you just get the 2, which is the octave that we know of. So that's how you divide an octave, a frequency ratio of 2, into 12 equal parts logarithmically, so that each interval can multiply by the previous number. So let's use that in our max patch. So we're going to use the expert object because it will let us raise a number to a power. And the number that we're going to raise to a power is 2. And we're going to put in a comma to separate the two arguments of something to something power. So it's 2 to something power. And namely, what the power that we're going to raise it to is whatever our input is divided by 12. So this is going to convert. The input is going to be some number of half steps, and the output is going to be a frequency ratio. So and multiply by the previous number. So let's use that in our max patch. Go up another half step by multiplying again by the 12 through 2. So it's based on dividing the octave into 12 equal parts. It's called 12-tone equal temperament. In this lesson, we're going to use some of our newly learned mathematical techniques to look a little bit more deeply into the question of musical scales and tuning and intervals and frequencies and these sorts of things. So first thing is I want to go back to uh, lesson two. Remember this, the uh, correct keyboard trigger to transposing sample? So we can play little goofy melodies. <laughs> And where did all these numbers come from? Uh, I just kind of told you not to think about it too much. But these are actually just intervals on the 12-tone uh, equal tempered scale. So the dominant tuning system of music today is based on dividing the octave into 12 equal parts. It's called 12-tone equal temperament because we are making equal divisions of the octave. Now we know that, uh, we, that we hear frequencies on a logarithmic scale. So these are logarithmic divisions of the octave. So uh, let's talk through the math for that. Take my word for it. You'll understand why in a moment. The 12th root of 2 is the frequency ratio that corresponds to a half step. So what is the 12th root of 2? It's about 1.059 something. And uh, where does this come from? So if you, if you have something and you play it at speed 1.059, you're playing a little bit faster. And it's just enough faster that it's going to be a half step higher. So speed 1.059. Speed 1 is the original speed 1.059 is a half step higher. What do we want to go two half steps higher? Well, we go up. One half step by multiplying by 1.059 and 12 through 2, and then we go up another half step by multiplying again by the 12 through 2. So uh, multiply it by 12 through 2 once to go up half step, multiply it by the 12 through 2 a second time to go up a second half step. So if we continue this process, third, fourth, fifth, all the way up to the 12th half step, we're multiplying our original, the original speed, 1, the default normal speed, by 12 through 2 times the 12 through 2 times 12 through 2, in other words, to the 12th power. And we know the 12 through 2 to the 12th power equals 1. It's like that uh, to the 12th power and the 12th root cancel each other, and you just get uh, you just get the 2, which is the octave that we know of. So that's how you divide an octave, a frequency ratio of 2, into 12 equal parts logarithmically, so that each interval can multiply by the previous number. So let's use that in our max patch. So we're going to use the expert object because it will let us raise a number to a power. And the number that we're going to raise to a power is 2. And we're going to put in a comma to separate the two arguments of something to something power. So it's 2 to something power. And namely, what the power that we're going to raise it to is whatever our input is divided by 12. So this is going to convert. The input is going to be some number of half steps. And the output is going to be a frequency ratio. So if we want to go up one half step, there's a 1.059, 463. If we want to go up two half steps, that's 1.22462, and we already know that's this number right here. We want to go four half steps, 1.259921, that's that number here. So that's, uh, I'm revealing my secrets, that's where all these numbers came from. So uh, this is just a part of a major scale in a 12 tone equal temperament starting here on the 4 key. So rather than having these crazy numbers, I'm going to just say that's zero half steps, that's minus one half steps, that's minus three half steps, that's minus five half steps, et cetera. So I'm going to simplify these numbers. Two, four, five, seven, and nine. But then I'm going to take them, and I'm not going to use those directly as the speed. I'm going to put them through my calculation here that turns it into the speed. So I think this is going to work like before. <laughs> Okay, so that worked. So uh, I simplified this patch by uh, by having it do its own computation rather than doing the computation outside of the patch and having the results of the computation as numbers that don't really mean much. Now, where do these numbers come from? That comes from the major scale. So if I look at a key slider, uh, if C is zero half steps, not that that oh, is necessarily C, but it's easier to see. Uh, if you're going down, the B below it is only one half step below. But then the A below it, there's this B flat in between, so that's why that number is a three. And again, between the A and the G, there's another half step, that A flat, so that's why that's a minus five. So uh, these numbers are the numbers of half steps, um, the corresponding not playback speed, but uh, number of half steps of transposition. So this is, one of the, uh, this is one of the hazards of commenting your code, is if you then change the code, uh, your comment might be out of date. So uh, you might someday come across a patch and you look at the comment and you're like, no, that's not true, that's not what it does. And it's probably a good chance that it's a situation like this one where a person commented and then they changed the way it worked and they forgot to change the comment. OK, so there's a, there's a new version of our query triggered transposing sample. So I'll save that for you. Uh, so one of the features I want to tell you about the M2F object, you, it has an attribute for the bass frequency. So a lot of times you hear about, oh, well, some orchestra is tuned to 442 hertz rather than 440 hertz or something. So you can set that here. So this bass basically means what is the frequency in hertz of the A above middle C, which happens to be MIDI note number 69. So uh, if it's 60 is no C, and there's nine half steps between that C and that A. So normally M2F has a base of 440, meaning that if you don't specify that attribute, and you put in 69, you get your 440. So if you want it to be 441, then you put in 69, you get 441, and then the whole system transposes by the right amount. So if you have uh, uh, 69 minus 12 is 57, so that would be uh, an octave below 440, so it'd be 220. If your A is 440, and if your A is 441, then it's 220 and a half. So um, what do you make this base be 1? Well, now 69 gives you 1, and 57 gives you a half. So you can say, I want my A 440 to be A1. Here's an even crazier thing you can do. You can say, um, let me show you because I made a patch that does this already. Use an M2F base. So if, if A is, if we set our base so that A is 1, and then we go up, then we need 69 half steps to get to our A. If we go up another 69 half steps, so we have 69 times 2, then that gets us to 53.817 blah, blah, blah hertz, which if you set that as the base of M2F, a little nerdy here, um, then that makes it so that if you put in a MIDI 0, you get 1 hertz. So this M2F at base, this crazy number that we just figured out, which is, uh, uh, again, if, you're, if your base frequency is 1 hertz, and you go up another 69 half steps above that, then that's 53. So in other words, 53.81, that's the frequency ratio for 69 half steps. And that's basically getting rid of this like crazy number 69 that's built in just because of our convention that we talk about tuning in terms of the A above middle C, which is a MIDI
it would give the same answer. So choose zero gives one, one gives one point over five. Yeah. Okay. So just uh, just uh, reinforcing what it means to convert between node numbers and frequency ratios, and the fact that normally you set a base pitch that's some high number, and you're using any numbers to give you actual frequencies. But if you uh, adjust things around, you can use the M2F object to give you frequency ratios. Next, I want to show you an object that is used for dealing with collections of data, and its name is call, C-O-L-L, -L, short for collection. And it works like this: you put one in your patch, and you can give it a name if you like. I'm going to say my data. And uh, where is this data stored? In the inspector, you can set uh, save data with patcher. I'm going to turn that on so that the data inside this collection will be, when I save this patch, it'll be saved along with the patch. Uh, you can also store the data in a separate text file, but then this brings up issues of uh, where you put that file and how does Max find it. I don't want to get there yet. So uh, we're just going to say save data with patcher. So if you lock the patch and you double click it, then it opens up this sort of text editor window. And uh, that's where you enter in the data. So each piece of data has an address, which can be either a, uh, a symbol or a number. Let's use numbers for addresses and then the data associated with it. So I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to spell out the first few numerals. That's enough. Um, and notice this format you've got the address and a comma and then the data, and then a semicolon. So uh, one good habit, in case you make an error, if you make a typing error, then uh, you might lose this data. So I always command A, select all, command C, copy, just in case I have a problem. And I close it, and it says store changes to my data before closing, yes, save. And so now I've got call my data. If I double click it, there it is again. I can close that window, cool. So uh, there's a lot of things you can do with call, but the most basic standard thing is to look up data. So I'll use a message box here, and I'll uh, take the output of call into the right inlet of the message box. And so I put a one in, then I get the symbol one, if I put a two in, I get the symbol two, put a three in, I get the symbol three. Um, call adds the word symbol if the data is just a single symbol, uh, which is a little bit irritating, um, but we don't need to worry about that right now. So we'll just uh, gloss that over. Uh, because what I want to do for scales is I want to save some, uh, let's not use that, let's make a new call called my scale. So uh, again, I'm going to make that be save data with patcher. Actually, what I want to do is I want to further clean up our query triggered transposing sample. There's the version with the crazy magic numbers. Here's the version that we just did with all these numbers. But I want to take this part and I'm going to replace it with a collection. So the one is the address and the data is going to be minus five. The two is the next address, the data is going to be minus three, etc. So I'm just going to put a call here and I'm going to call it key two uh, half steps because it's going to tell me its, it's input is going to be these individual number keys and the output is going to be the number of half steps. And that's going to replace all of this stuff. So let me uh, let me put this next to there so I can see what's happening. So the key one is going to give us minus five half steps. The key two is going to give us minus three half steps and so on. And again, just to be safe, it looks like I got it right, but I'm going to copy just because I'm paranoid. Save that. Yes. Open it again. Data's there. That's good. Double check that it's in save with patcher mode. No. Better turn that on again. Try that again. Let me save with data patcher. Yes. OK, so if these notes come in, then it should give us the number of half steps that we asked for. So four is zero half steps, three, two, one. OK, looks like it's doing what I want. So I'm going to take that number of half steps and plug it straight into here. And now I can delete all this stuff. And that even gives me room to put this stuff over here. So turn it on. Does it still work like before? <laughs> yep, still works like before. So by storing our lookup table of data in the collection object, uh, it's greatly simplified the patch. We didn't need that big select object and all those different message boxes for all the different possibilities. We just put all the possibilities into our collection, and uh, it makes the makes the patch not only easier to look at, but I would say easier to modify. So I can go in, I can change the key to half steps, and I can say, you know what, let's make it a uh, let's make it a minor scale. I'm gonna take that note down a half step. I'm gonna take that note down a half step. I'm gonna take that note down a half step. And uh, that was a lot easier than changing all those uh, all those message boxes. So I'm gonna save this, and now. <laughs> Okay, so I was pretty easily able to change the, change the scale. So I like, I like the fact that it's consolidated all the information about what scale I'm going to use just in one object here with a, with a data file that I can edit rather than having to uh, you know, go through all these different message boxes. Another big topic that uses mathematics in the realm of math